Hello, everybody. I know the first person you want to talk to in the morning is a, a regulatory attorney, right? <laughs> All right. So the news of late has been unavoidable. The government has been expressing its might in the Web3 space. Just one example is the ongoing tussle between Coinbase and the SEC. There are others. We'll talk about some of them. But regulations are needed to address um, important and legitimate policy objectives, um, such as preventing illicit finance, ensuring fair markets, um, and protecting consumers. So educating yourself about the regulatory landscape is a necessity for you to be successful entrepreneurs. First, let me introduce myself. I'm Michelle. And before I had the good fortune of working with uh, Web3 founders at A16Z, I spent a couple of decades at the federal government. Um, first as a financial crimes investigator, then as a prosecutor and a policy advisor for the Department of Justice. And then my last stop was at the Department of the Treasury, leading digital asset matters at the uh, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, otherwise known as FinCEN, which I'm going to talk about today. During this talk, I can promise you that I'm going to repeat two things over and over again. Um, one is that before proceeding in various contexts, you should consult an attorney or an expert advisor. And the second thing I'm going to tell you over again is that you should consult an attorney or an expert advisor. Um, one important caveat to that, although I am an attorney, I am not employed by A16Z in a legal capacity, so none of what I'm going to say in this presentation is legal advice. So there's many agencies within the government. We're not going to cover them all, and none of them in great depth. Um, but I hope to offer you some familiarity with the major players um, and the rules of the road in Web3, and that as you're building, that you're considering the regulatory implications um, of your choices and that if a regulator comes knocking, that you are well-informed and prepared. Understanding the regulatory environment is going to help you to build a better business. Okay, let's get started with the fundamentals. So regulation is simply rules made by a government or another authority in order to control the way something is done or the way people behave. But what's the difference between regulation and policy? Well, if you think about the regulation being the rules that are on the books right now that you have to follow, and policy is the process for getting the rules, laws, and the business environment that you want in the future. And this afternoon, Colin, our head of government affairs, is going to talk about legislative policy. But first, let's talk about the here and now. So who in government regulates crypto and Web3? The answer, many agencies, and it depends. And sometimes there are multiple agencies that will have jurisdiction over the business activity that you're engaged in. Let's try to make sense of this alphabet soup of agency, shall we? So we're going to take a deeper dive into the market regulators and the treasury offices in just a bit. But I want to briefly mention two categories of agencies, the banking agencies, and um, the Department of Justice and Law Enforcement. The primary federal banking agencies consist of the Federal Reserve Board and System, the Office of the Contro Comptroller of the Currency, uh, the, known as the OCC, uh, colloquially, and also the Federal Deposit Insurance uh, Corporation, the FDIC. You might be wondering, I'm not offering banking services or seeking to, uh, to get a bank charter. Why do I need to know about these agencies? Well, you should care because these agencies are in positions um, where statements of them, made by them, and positions that they may take can greatly affect your Web3 business. How? First, your ability to get a bank account and to maintain a bank account for running your day-to-day -day operations. Um, everyone needs banking services to make payroll and to pay for a myriad of your um, expenses. Um, and recently, these agencies have attributed um, much risk in the financial system to cryptocurrency and related crypto businesses. So this can affect banking relationships, and these are agencies that you want to keep your eye on. Um, second, where and how you could custody your crypto. 
um, could be affected by decisions of these agencies. And last, banking agencies are likely to be um, leading the charge relating to regulations and supervision of stable coins, which we all know are a kind of a very important, uh, they play an important role in the crypto ecosystem. The other player in the space to be aware of, and this is my old alma mater, is the Department of Justice and their companion law enforcement agencies. Their primary job is to investigate and prosecute violations of criminal law, and some regulatory infractions can also be charged criminally, and that would be handled by the Department of Justice. And that can happen primarily with violations of the Bank Secrecy Act and sanctions, which I'm gonna talk about later. In addition, if you decide to sue some regulatory agencies because you're, you think you're being treated unfairly under the law, um, the Department of Justice has a civil division called Federal Programs um, that would be defending the agency being sued in court. Now, although today's talk is focused on U.S. regulation, you need to be cognizant um, that non-U.S. countries also have their own regulations pertaining to this industry. And some of those rules are similar to the US's, and some of them um, are gonna be different. Um, just know that legal or physical presence of a business is not the sole determining factor as to whether the laws apply to you. So if you're providing products or services to residents of a country, then you may likely be subject to regulatory law. And this is vice versa. You could be completely set up physically and legally set up um, outside of the U.S., but if you are serving U.S. citizens or residents, then you would also um, fall under the jurisdiction of the U.S. regulatory agencies. Now, as we turn to the agencies who are taxed with regulating the market and uh, investment activities, and also with addressing national security concerns, there's one commonality. Um, in one way or another, they all regulate financial activity. And financial activity is a fundamental aspect of any business, including the building, computing, and operating of Web3 products and services. Let's talk about the Department of Treasury. Relevant to this discussion is an independent bureau called the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, or FinCEN, and the office within Treasury called the Office of Foreign Assets Control, otherwise known as OFAC. Both of these report to the Undersecretary of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence, or TFI, which not surprisingly focuses, their, um, focuses them on national security and reducing or eliminating um, illicit activity in the financial system. FinCEN is the administrator of the Bank Secrecy Act, or um, the BSA, and it supervises financial institutions, and it also um, supervises money transmission. So this is where a lot of crypto businesses may intersect with the Department of Treasury and FinCEN's BSA. Uh, basically, it's a legislative framework or a series of laws. It was created in the 1960s, or rather 70s, um, and it requires U.S. financial institutions to assist um, both government agencies and law enforcement um, in detecting money laundering and other illicit activities. So how do you know if you're engaged in money transmission and you must comply with the Bank Secrecy Act? So first, FinCEN has put out guidance, actually all the way back to 2013, that said that exchangers, issuers, and administrators of convertible virtual currencies are money transmitters. Users are not. Um, second, money transmission is very broadly defined. So generally, it's the transmission of funds or value that substitutes as currency, which is going to capture a lot of cryptocurrency tokens, et cetera, um, from one person or location to another person or location by any means. So you see how really broad that is for coverage. Whether a token is a convertible virtual currency is a facts and circumstances determination. I will tell you though, most are. And unless they operate exclusively in a centralized and closed system, kind of like airline points, where there's not a secondary market for them to um, 
to be bought and sold and traded around, um, they're likely going to be considered a convertible virtual currency or value that substitutes for currency, um, as FinCEN defines it. Sometimes um, the, the way a code or, or tech operates is going to make the determination as to whether or not the business is engaged in money transmission a complex and difficult determination. So here's the first time I say it. Consulting an attorney or an expert advisor is often going to be the key to determining what your obligations are. Also, um, you see on the top of the slide, I, I've cited the USA Patriot Act. Patriot Act. Um, after 9-11, Congress passed this act to punish terrorist acts in the United States and also to deter um, this type of activity around the world and also to enhance law enforcement tools for this type of collection. Um, there are additional authorities that now supplement the Bank Secrecy Act um, that mostly fall in OFAC's jurisdiction, but, but some fall in FinCEN's. The other thing that the Patriot Act did that's, that's a good thing is that it enabled public and private sharing of information. So if you're engaged in some type of financial activity or you see suspicious activity, um, it authorizes um, law enforcement and the Department of Treasury to be sharing information with um, public, private sector entities and, and vice versa in order to um, accomplish these goals. Now, under the Bank Secrecy Act, you know, what are, your, what are the requirements? What do you have to do? Um, and this is related to, again, the anti-money laundering laws, financial institutions, including the non-bank money transmitters. Well, they must register with FinCEN, establish and maintain an effective risk-based anti-money laundering program, establish effective customer due diligence, um, or a, th this comes in the form of a customer identification program. All of you may be familiar with this um, when you talk about the term KYC, know your customer, know your customer or KYC is part of having to have this customer identification program. Um, you have to screen against OFAC and other government lists. We're gonna talk about that in a second. You have to establish an effective way of monitoring for suspicious activity and file suspicious activity reports. And there are also other record keeping and reporting requirements that I won't get into today. In certain circumstances, FinCEN also has the authority to designate entities as um, primary money laundering concerns. And when they do that, this effectively cuts the entity off from the financial system, and it means that you can't touch them either. Um, the other thing that could affect businesses broader is their authority. Um, this is under special measures. Um, and that is um, GTOs. They're called geographic targeting orders. Um, some examples of them that you may have heard about is where real estate um, in certain areas, um, those transactions have additional reporting requirements directly to Treasury. Um, we've also seen it um, in insurance related to um, other illicit cyber activity. Um, so it's, it's important to know that there are other authorities separate from um, the Bank Secrecy Act that even if you're not covered by them because you're not a money transmitter, Treasury could produce an order and say, hey, you know, you're required to report this information. In addition, certain types of businesses regulated by the SEC and the CFTC, they may have some AML, BSA AML um, requirements. So just because you're not a financial institution or a money transmitter doesn't mean that you may um, not also have to have, uh, be collecting KYC or have some type of AML program requirements. Finally, let's not forget about the states, right? Um, most states regulate money transmission, and they may uh, require you to get a money transmission license um, before you can do business with residents of that state. Um, there are law firms that specialize in obtaining those um, MTLs, as we call them. And note that if you want to do crypto business in New York, then expect that you're going to spend some money because the NYDFS, the New York Department of Financial Services, um, requires you to obtain a BIT license from them. And not only is this a rigorous licensing um, application process, but they also supervise um, licensees vigorously. Um, again, an attorney well-versed in money transmission law um, and regulation can help you navigate what may seem like um, a pretty complex area. 
So now we're going to talk about the Office of Foreign Assets Control, um, OFAC. This is a really important office within the Department of Treasury. And the reason why is their, their broad coverage. So let me talk about what they do. They administer and enforce um, economic and trade sanctions um, based on U.S. foreign policy and national security goals. And it's usually targeted against foreign countries um, and regimes, terrorists, international narcotics traffickers, um, et cetera. Those people that are engaged in activities related to the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Um, you may have seen recent um, sanctions that have been put out against North Korea, some of the cyber um, criminal activities that have been engaged by state actors um, from uh, DPRK um, in order to um, obtain um, funds since they have been um, blocked from ec other um, economic, normal and economic activities. Um, their sanctions programs work by using the blocking or freezing of assets and also trade restrictions to accomplish these goals. So this is one of the regulators that you need to really care about, um, regardless of what type of business model you have. It doesn't really matter what the business does um, because their authority is really broad. It applies to US persons, um, and that's citizens, permanent residents, and all persons and entities within the United States, um, all US incorporated, incorporated entities and their foreign branches. So, I don't have to go on and on. You, you see where I'm going with this. Pretty much everybody um, has to, it, it falls under their jurisdiction. And this means what? At a minimum, you should be screening against OFAC's um, list of specially designated nationals and blocked persons. This is often referred to as the SDN. Sometimes people call it OFAC's blacklist. Um, and the information about what's on that list is on their website. Um, what will be relevant to you as Web3 builders are um, cryptocurrency addresses. There are plenty of them on there. They're constantly being added, but know that you don't want to get in, in OFAX crosshairs. And, and why? Well, because the consequences are very serious. First of all, civil liability. That's where you didn't intend to transact with that North Korean address. You had no idea that that happened, but in fact, it did. And therefore, you are in violation of sanctions just by the mere fact that it happened, regardless of whether you knew about it at the time or intended. It's called strict civil liability. And it's very, very expensive. The fines are horrendous. Um, and you can lose your banking and other business relationships. And so doing, at the minimum, screening of incoming and outgoing addresses and if you're conducting um, bank transact regular fiat bank transactions are really important. So severe penalties, losses of relationships um, that will allow you to go forward with the business. And certainly there are also, as I mentioned before, are criminal penalties. Now, I know that none of you are gonna have to worry about that because um, in order to be guilty or be charged with a criminal penalty, you would have to knowingly um, be knowingly transacting with a sanctioned entity, look, seeking to help um, these countries or entities or persons that are, engaged, that are on the list. Um, and so um, a lot of times people talk about going to jail with sanctions, and that's going to be rare, rare circumstances. Most of the people who get in trouble with OFAC is because they were negligent or lazy about not um, setting up screening and watching what was coming in um, to their house and what was going out. So, you don't always have to pay an expensive attorney to get information. That's, that's the good thing. And not all attorneys are expensive. Um, many useful resources are published by these regulatory agencies and are available free on their websites. Um, I encourage you to read and even consider subscribing to some of these um, guidance, advisories, and alerts that are periodically published. Um, just two examples I want to recommend, particularly if you may be involved in financial activity or money transmission or think you are building towards that end, is the 2019 guidance that FinCEN published. It has a lot of good information about different types of technologies and business models and what might qualify as money transmission or not. Um, and then second, um, the 
Cyber Infrastructure and Security Agency, sometimes referred to as CISA, um, and the FBI frequently publish joint alerts um, about cyber um, security incidents, um, ransomware, et cetera. They contain really good descriptions of these incidents, um, including um, methods of identified threat actors, um, and they usually include technical details about the code and suggested mitigation member, me measures. So given that you're all um, conducting Web3 and online activities, I highly recommend those resources. So now let's turn to um, the securities and commodities laws and the, the two primary agencies, although there are some smaller peripheral agencies that, that dip their toe in this, we're going to talk about the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. So generally, digital assets can be created that resemble securities or commodities, as well as rights to goods, services, and IP. This flexibility sometimes results in uncertainty over which regulator has jurisdiction, given the differences in how the agencies operate. Um, it can be important to get good advice on how any token you may want to deploy may be viewed. Um, the commodity futures um, are regulated by the CFTC, as I mentioned, securities by the SEC, and commodity spot markets not really directed, directly regulated by either, but the CFTC has jurisdiction over fraud in the spot market. So, as I'm sure you've heard, um, while the markets have generally viewed only highly decentralized network tokens like Bitcoin um, and um, Ether, depending on who you talk to, as commodities, the current SEC commissioner has asserted um, that virtually all tokens other than Bitcoins um, are securities under the Supreme Court's Howey test. Um, so I know that this is something that you need to think about um, as you're thinking about how you're going to design and also deploy your tokens, both, both now and in the future. And um, unfortunately, the law is still in flux. Um, but again, um, Colin's going to talk this afternoon about some legislative um, activity that's happening in D.C. on this front. A founder may think um, that he or she is not covered by the securities law if you're not engaged in, say, fundraising efforts, right? Um, you've already, you know, you've built your product and it's out there. You're not selling tokens in order to fundraise. Um, but remember that the laws can be implicated by the products and the projects um, and the project that the project itself is designing. Um, and so you need to remain f flexible, particularly as these laws are changing, meaning guidance and rules um, may change over time. And it's important to design with operational flexibility. Um, in mind as you're figuring out what you're going to um, do with your business. And even if you've got everything figured out and you've run it by attorneys and you've run it by securities experts, if you decide to pivot or expand, um, again, this is an area of the regulatory law that you're going to need to revisit with each um, pivot and change of your business model. All right, so your favorite thing, tax, right? Um, all I have to say is file and pay your taxes, right? Um, the IRS is actually um, a, a fairly friendly um, agency, in my opinion, in this space, because they're actually um, very good listeners as they're trying to develop um, how um, these digital assets should be treated for tax purposes. They've done a lot of interaction with private sector in order to really understand the technology and figure out um, what is going to work best. Um, so I had a chance to talk to one of our tax experts, and she gave me a few tips that I just wanted to run by you to remember. Um, that your federal corporate income tax um, is also due on April 15th, but you can extend all the way out to October 15th. Um, when you're filing and deciding where you're going to file state income tax returns, um, that that's going to be determined by um, generally the physical presence of where you are, but it also could be affected by market source, meaning um, the based on the sales in a particular state. Um, knowing California that there's a minimal, minimum annual tax of uh, $800 dollars, and in some states, you have to pay sales tax if, you've, if sales tax is applicable on a monthly basis. Um, so the takeaway for all of these as far as filing is there are a lot of different dates and due dates and filing requirements. So um, again, going back to the theme, 
um, talk to an attorney or a tax consultant. These things can be complicated um, when you're running these types of businesses. All right, so there's also a lot of different reporting requirements depending on, again, what type of business you're running and also which, uh, the location of the customers that you're serving. When thinking about tax costs, you don't want to forget that annual registration and business licenses need to be paid or included and are important uh, part of your tax health. Also know that valuation can vary greatly for different types of stock options if that's something that's going on um, with, your, uh, with your business. Looking forward um, to developing areas that you're going to want to watch is um, how IRS is going to treat NFTs um, and how they're going to treat staking activities. Those are still things that are being decided. And in fact, one of the reasons why um, I said that IRS is, is friendly in this regard is that they actually have put out a request for comment um, to the ecosystem and industry to provide information about what are you doing with your NFTs? How should they, how should they be treated? Um, they want to take in all this information so that they um, can tax this appropriately and fairly. Long story short, a lot of moving parts with tax, so consult a tax advisor or an attorney. All right, I'm getting some smiles, but you're not like repeating back to me yet. <laughs> All right, so what are the circumstances in which you may want or need to communicate or interact with regulators? Um, we're gonna turn to two types of interactions, um, reactive and proactive. When you want to go to them, proactive, and when they come to you, reactive. Um, and particularly those proactive interactions um, can be really beneficial opportunities. Um, despite all of the, the bad that's the focus of the news with regulators lately, um, most regulators, particularly the career staff at these agencies, um, they are very eager to learn about the latest technology. Um, they want to do this um, because they want to hear about the developing business models. It helps them to do their jobs better. If they're supervising the industry, it helps them to understand what's going on. And they want to know what's coming next, the emerging tech, which is what all of you are working on. So there are lots of ways to interact with them. Some agencies have offices. Um, for example, the SEC um, has a FinHub, which used to be visited in the past quite a lot, but perhaps doesn't get as much traffic these days. Um, FinCEN often hosts innovation hours that are based on topic. So if you're working on digital identity, for example, there could be innovation hours related to that um, in different topics. Some of the regulatory agencies have, um, have some type of regulatory lab. Um, there are opportunities to present um, demos of your, of your products for them um, and interaction and interact with them at conferences and tech sprints that they may host. Um, in addition, um, there are opportunities, and if appropriate, you should um, definitely reach out and schedule meetings to talk to them um, so that you can get clarity as to how you think you fit into the regulatory regime and what the expectations are for supervision. Um, but again, going back to the repeat, you should consult um, a legal advisor before marching into a regulatory agency and trotting out your wares. Ultimately, however, and this is why I, I turn to this, their jobs are to supervise the industries and certain types of activities, right? And to enforce the rules and non-compliance within their remit. And so uh, there are going to be times when you are going to um, get uh, a reactive interaction or a reactive contact um, from a regulatory agency. Some of the, those are the, oh, I need to call an attorney, and others are, hey, they're just looking for information and doing their jobs, they're not looking at me. Um, so examples of, um, oh, I need to go talk to an attorney are requests for information, um, notices of investigations. Um, you may have heard about the Wells notice, you don't want that. Uh, that's where um, they're announcing that they are investigating you and they're giving you notice so that you can basically talk to them and convince them why you shouldn't be charged. Um, you also could get subpoenas, um, search warrants, seizure warrants, particularly if you're custodying crypto. Um, those are things that, again, I think talking to um, inside or outside counsel before proceeding or, uh, is important, um, but you shouldn't assume that there's a problem. 
Um, sometimes it's that evidence happened to land um, in your lap in your business in some way, shape, or form. And sometimes you may get legal process, and this is why talking to counsel is good, and law enforcement might be looking for something um, that you don't have, that you don't actually have. They often have a hard time um, figuring out the myriad of businesses and where data may be held or where ass who has control over assets. Um, and so it's simply sometimes pointing them over to the next guy. All right, so as we've discussed, crypto and Web3 is a very fluid and develop developing area of regulation. Um, Again, I've repeated this later today, our head of government affairs is going to be talking to you about what's happening in Washington. But it's really important to monitor these ongoing activities. I know that you're busy trying to build your business and hire engineers and write code and all of the, all of the really challenging things that you're doing. Um, but in developing your business, watching the new legislation, the ongoing court cases, and the agency rulemakings and actions, these could affect the rules of the road and how you're gonna proceed as you're building. In particular, I would encourage you to follow the court cases. Um, the reason why is it's a lot more interesting to read kind of the important tidbits um, that affect what's going on in the regulatory space when you see it with facts set out in something that you understand. Um, now, one case to watch in my opinion is one that I, um, well, I actually was gonna allude to at the beginning of my talk, but I forgot to. And um, just yesterday, so it's very timely, the Supreme Court announced that they are going to hear a case um, that could overturn a 40-year precedent um, that we uh, talk about as a legal concept called um, Chevron deference. And Chevron deference means that um, a court is required to defer to a government agency's interpretation of the law. So you can be challenging that agency in court, but they're always going to get the benefit of the doubt in the eyes of the court as far as the interpretation of that agency action. And what does this case involve? Um, it, in it involves not crypto or Web3. Um, it involves herring fishermen. And herring fishermen in the Atlantic specifically, who say that the National Marine Fisheries Service, which falls under the Commerce Department, um, doesn't have the authority to require them to pay the salaries of government monitors that are required to actually be on their boats while they're fishing. Um, so the law requires, as it stands right now, that you have monitors on your fishing boats and not only do you have to make space for them, but you also have to pay their salaries. Um, this is being challenged in the court and it's gonna go um, to the Supreme Court. It was just, um, the regulatory agency um, position was affirmed in the appellate court and the Supreme Court yesterday said, we'll hear it next, next uh, term. So this is important because it could affect what the standard is when the courts are looking at regulatory action in a very hot space of the law, and that's crypto, Web3, and particularly the securities laws. So remember, it's better to be reading about and following the cases than living them, right? Okay, so I know that was a lot to take in, so here's my Ted Lasso pep talk to leave you with. Um, when written and implemented well and fit for purpose, regulations are a good thing. Um, they should be promoting a safe and fair playing field um, for innovation, creativity, and economic opportunities for them to thrive. Um, compliant businesses um, are successful businesses because they prevent their use by bad actors, including abusive and authoritarian regimes. None of you want to be facilitating that, right? And because they instill trust in the customers and the creators who use them, and the builders who are gonna build on top of them. So here's the last thing to remember before I close and open for questions. Um, given the increased focus on crypto issues by all of the regulators, but particularly the SEC's barrage of enforcement cases that, we, that we've seen out there, what is it important for you to do? It's important more than ever to consult good legal counsel to inform your token and product um, design and launch 
to determine your obligations under the Bank Secrecy Act um, or the tax laws and to assess your sanctions exposures. Um, where appropriate, you should be building compliance programs and screening mechanisms um, that's gonna minimize um, the risk of events that's gonna draw regulatory scrutiny to you. Um, the good news is that you're not alone in this. Um, this is not just about avoiding fines, unwanted penalties, um, getting shut down, or going to jail. What's, this is really about is building a trusted customer experience. Um, you've done all of this work, you have a lot of work ahead of you, and you want it to be a successful, safe, and compliant place um, for people to, uh, to interact with, to go to, and for you to be um, successful in contributing members of, um, of society as entrepreneurs. Thank you for your attention and time. Thank you, Michelle.